Lightbringer by Pierce Brown. As of 2023 is the latest release in the Red Rising saga and the second to last book in the series as a whole. This book, as every Red Rising book before it, prominently follows our main protagonist, Darrow, a rebel who has spent the better part of a decade bathing the stars in blood. But with Lightbringer being the second to last book in the Red Rising series, a prominent question within the pages is whether or not Darrow can evolve beyond the mythic rebel status he has and instead transform into a well-rounded leader. And there's a balance to that because Darrow can't let go of the image he's built. He still needs to be able to walk in a room and make any gold tremble in their boots but there are limitations to his power and his potential. A brutal lesson he has learned several times, but is finally seeming to stick after the horrific events of the last book. And so within Lightbringer, we are seeing Darrow in some ways rein in his ego and start to operate almost as a politician, though he can't really let go of some of the Darrowisms during that process. But the main fuel stoking the fire that's preventing Darrow from just easily shifting gears into this greater leader position is maybe his most obnoxious protagonist yet, Lysander. A man whose sense of entitlement and self-importance somehow vastly overshadows Darrow's own. And in anticipation for the release of Lightbringer, I actually got to sit down with Pierce Brown and talk about some of these themes. And so when Darrow was crawling out of a low pace place when he was 16, he could ride that uh, rage train, you know, all the way to the bank, so to speak. But now he's finding that rage isn't enough. He's found he's out of fuel. How can he change his own internal engine to run on something different? Basically, like you run out of fossil fuels, right? Uh, it, has, it has to be a self-sustaining engine because things still need to get done. There's a lot of parallels in this book with Red Rising and with Golden Sun. The Lightbringer is about how Darrow has learned lessons perhaps goes about something differently. And it was really fascinating to get Pierce Brown's full thoughts on the flaws Darrow has with him. And part of that is Darrow has always been special in some sense. Yes, he came from the bottom rungs of society, but he was still the best at what he did even down there. And I gotta say this balance of character work being in the spotlight for a lot of Lightbringer assuaded many of the concerns I had coming into this book. It being the second to last of the Red Rising series, I was really afraid how the narrative could possibly be positioned in one book to get from where we were to it seems set up for the final breaths of this series. Now it all makes sense because Dark Age needed to drag Darrow low. So far down that he begins to operate on the same level of many people that he is able to just bowl himself through previously. I think this adds stakes in a way and with the pacing of this book, the overall appeal with a lot of fan just payoff type events happening, this certainly has the potential like almost every Red Rising book of being many fans' favorite. Within the pages, you can feel intention, evolution, still definitely staying true to the spirit of Red Rising, which is a nice transition into us actually talking about the details. We start after the events of Dark Age with Darrow at the lowest we have seen him in a long time, physically, mentally, and how he is viewed from the outside in. But you'd have to have not been paying attention to Red Rising up until this point to not see the potential buried within a Darrow who has been knocked down. I get no a blow landed rising from defeat is one of Pierce Brown's specialties and always tastes oh so good as a reader. From here, Darrow is sent a challenge in the form of a potential trap. And this is where my biggest gripe for Lightbringer kind of comes into play. We are presented with a Darrow who is more mature than the one we've seen before and much more aware of his vulnerabilities. But he's still making just stupidly bold decisions. Within the text, they're believable because we are, of course, as readers, supposed to view Darrow as this almost mythological Achilles type demigod, but he's not that literally. It's starting to feel like there should be more direct consequences any time Darrow makes one of these just over the top decisions, but there just isn't all the time. It's just in a series that has had such teeth up until this point, I'm starting to feel plot armor in certain points more overtly than I was before, even when it was there. That's not to say though that Lightbringer doesn't have prices for characters to pay. I'm not gonna get into spoilers, but Pierce Brown still clearly gets a kick out of kicking his readers in the emotional balls. And the last 25% of Lightbringer are essentially an emotional crop being harvested before we get into this series 
series' final notes. A few of those notes, though, that are repeated throughout the series are starting to get a little bit overplayed. While I still love how Pierce Brown handles action in the moment, the actual, like, viscera of bloodshed in Red Rising is borderline unrivaled in science fiction. On a more macro view, Red Rising's battles are becoming almost formulaic in their chaos because I just know Pierce Brown's going to lean into the no plan survives the first, you know, impact or punch, whatever, uh, mentality, and we're going to go from, okay, here's the plan to subversion, subversion, subversion. Still, though, I am just in awe of Red Rising's wondrous, futuristic, blood deluge. It's just one of those things where if you pull your head out of the bucket of blood, you'll see it's a bit similar to other buckets of blood. <laughs> but I am happy to say I also found some real breaths of fresh air here in Lightbringer. The cost and toll of the long-term effects of this war are focused on uh, more so in this book than they ever have been before in terms of just certain people who are victims of all the action going on, uh, essentially giving up. They're seeing the cancerous toll that's being taken on all of the planets around them. And it's interesting to see there are uh, certain people who have just decided to essentially quit. It's an idea that takes this grandiose, over-the-top sci-fi epic and successfully brings it back to a more human level, which, which is related to the final emotions Lightbringer inflicted on me. And it's a really pleasant blend of catharsis and tension, because I feel like on a character level, I have reached catharsis with how I can see certain characters are going to go from here or where they've come to rest now in their either better view of themselves or their ideology. But in terms of the stakes of the action of what's to come, it just feels like all the party members are geared up to go on that final excursion that I know is going to cost us, the fans, some of our favorite members of this uh, catalog. Where will the next betrayal come in and how horrific of a death is a character I love going to suffer are questions that still hang deliciously in the air. And I could see some people maybe having a little bit of a problem with just how much POV bouncing there is going on here in Lightbringer, but I found it to absolutely serve a purpose. Especially Virginia shines as a female leader here in ways that very often authors do not allow female leaders to shine. These beats also affirm to me why Virginia is such a great pick as a partner for Darrow. Even apart, I can feel these two's connection coming through so strongly in terms of where Darrow has weaknesses, Virginia has strengths and vice versa. And I want to see at their peak, both of them like at the command together, because I feel like it would just be a, a symphony here. Severo also begins to really shift in mold more drastically than I think he's had the opportunity to before in Red Rising. And this is a great case of how you as a reader can know this is earned proper character growth. This is where this person should go, but it's oh so painful to watch them go that way. And it doesn't mean it feels good seeing it happen. It's one of those cases where you're like, yeah, this is what was set up. And of course, this allows us to get to know Lysander better. And I cannot say it was a pleasant experience getting to know Lysander at all, but thematically for Red Rising, it felt like the perfect choice because Lysander conceptually as an antagonist is essentially the hardest for Darrow, in my opinion, to have to deal with, not on a physical level even, but more just who he is. He is a pill. He is the most obnoxious, hard to swallow pill in existence, and he's coming into play in a major way at a time where Darrow is having to make concessions. That being said, I do not think Lannister is the best Red Rising villain by a long shot. I still am just a jackal simp fight me. But in a book that is so intent on the cross-section of ideology and action, Lysander feels like the ultimate spark to just force on in there. And you find yourself wondering who in our cast of characters is willing to actually back up their ideology for a greater good by making concessions and allying themselves in ways they previously didn't want to for other threats that are on the horizon coming in. And in all great political struggles, there's the question of who is going to stand by their word and who is actually just trying to move to position themselves for better power, better legacy, et cetera, et cetera. And with the egos at play, 
you could really ask it of anybody. And I feel like the next book is going to have quite a bit hinging on characters being able to put down their arms when they realize they're wrong, something that sounds oh so simple in premise, but when you look at who you're trying to push that idea towards, it becomes so much more complicated. All of this moves in a way towards basically the predominant question for Red Rising for the last several books, and that is whether or not Darrow wants peace more than he wants revenge. We all know what the answer would have been in book one, but what about now? And conversely, can others that Darrow has wronged, which yes, Darrow is on the right side of history, but he has still wronged people, can they forgive him in the advancement for peace? And it's not even direct peace, it's overcoming something else to hopefully find, you all know what I'm talking about if you've read Lightbringer or even Dark Age. And I find the people having to do that against Darrow, not on the moral larger picture scale, but on the more personal one, are having to do something harder than Darrow, because he is the one who is largely responsible for this war. It's his fault but he was on the right side. Yeah, though, very, very easily, I am feeling a strong nine out of 10 for Lightbringer. There are some minor gripes I had here, but with the overwhelming, fascinating thematic questions that are being forced onto characters that we know so well, all skinned over with Pierce Brown's wonderful prose and just fabulous setting, Lightbringer's an easy win for me. All of that while moving the story along with action sequences that feel like if they were adapted would be some of the most awe-inspiring to see on a screen. It's a solid reminder why Pierce Brown is widely considered one of the best sci-fi writers of our time for this subgenre of sci-fi. But okay, let's get into uh, mild spoilers here, because I gotta say some things that I really, really want to say starting now. Atlantia is this big old potential unifier. And of course, in typical Pierce Brown fashion, and due to all the conflicts that are currently ongoing, it can't be as simple as everyone just being super smart and getting in line to fight this other thing. In a lesser author's hands, it would be unbelievable for characters to not just, all right, let's go take care of this other thing, but because of how thoroughly understood conflict is at all stages of Red Rising, you absolutely believe these people can't just put everything aside and suddenly work together. And so instead of getting that simpler path, the uh, final vomit-inducing scene with Lysander we get is essentially him going after food while speaking about how wondrous what he's doing is. And it's just, he's a I don't have any other word to put there. It's the one that feels right, so I'm gonna use it, sorry. And I love that the final nail in the coffin for this potential full unification we saw almost within reach was the death of a character that had such complexity to them, but also definitely felt like it was the time for them to go if they were going to, and that'd be the death of Cassius. And this emotional haymaker hits in a way where the true brilliance of Lightbringer for me is posing all those questions I talked about are like, are you mature enough? Can you get over these past wrongs? But then making you the reader with the death of this character be like, it, kill him! Death is the only true path to peace. Because you love Cassius so much and what Darrow and M have been through up to this point, it's just like seeing it get taken out by such a piece of shit. Leave it to Pierce Brown to not only have resonant ideas in his text, but then put you in a position to remind you, the reader, if you're sitting here thinking like, of course these people would get over this. Psh, it's stupid, they're not in conflict, to be like, oh yeah? How about now? <laughs> it's a reminder that these are human beings who aren't gonna be perfect and are emotional, and he does it to you to stick that. And then we also have what my friend Max referred to as a parody of Daro, Volson Far within the Obsidians, essentially doing a Daro. I will say though, I'm not the biggest fan of super weapons. Things being introduced that just address overtly uh, such a major part of the world. And of course, I'm talking about the color super weapon here. I feel the tension of whoever's hands it's in because immediately you just see like what the outcome, it forces you to picture the future of it activated by whatever that person's cause is. But I, I just don't personally love those kind of super weapons. I've seen them too often used for easy outs, but I hope I'm proven wrong here. But that is just my review of Lightbringer. I guess listened to people and finally got the mic 
out from the side and put it directly in front of me. That way it's better for thumbnails, but this thing's just like a little too tall. Anyway, that's not important. You should go ahead and check out some merch over at danielbgreen.com. You can get the fantastic ghost tees ghost tea or the Taya cybernetics tea if you so choose. You can also pick up my book on Backer Kit right now or through the links provided down below. Have a good one, y'all. Bye.